If you have your outlines from last session, I'd like to go back there. I'm just feeling the, I don't want to leave something undone. So instead of going on to Jonah session three and then to Habakkuk session four for tomorrow, I'm going to back up and just get that other passage from Hosea. And so we're going to stay with kind of the Christmas theme, uh, Christmas nuggets, if you will, from these minor prophets. I hope that'll be okay for you. Um, And so you might want to turn in your Bibles. We've been kind of summarizing a lot of text, shooting a lot of scriptures at you, kind of like a machine gun. I do want to look at Hosea 11 with you. So if you have your Bibles or devices, you might turn there. I don't know that we'll have to turn to the Matthew uh, passage in chapter 2, verse 15. You pretty much would know that's the same one, and you know the context of Matthew 2 better. Uh, I've called this kind of the paradox of Christmas. Christmas comes to us kind of in paradox. Dr. Shaw Lincoln used to say a paradox is a truth stuck on its head, and that's really right. It's an upside down thing. It doesn't seem quite right to us when you first hear it. But there's a lot of angst in Christmas. I think you'd probably agree with that, having just come through that season, and sometimes the the programming of the church can just be wild, and a lot of things going on and such. Us kids sometimes have uh, have angst at Christmas time. It's a paradox. It's such a good time, and yet there's difficulties. Maybe it's uh, that the kid didn't get the right present or whatever, you know. My son, Corey, who's a a music minister, uh, he was with me on a speaking trip one time, and we were, it wasn't Christmas, but it was this kid's birthday in the home in which we were being hosted. And uh, this kid was opening his gifts for his birthday, and he would just wildly scream when he'd open up one of his gifts, you know. Oh, this, this toy, or this thing that he wanted so much. And he did that through several times, and then he opened up the present from Grandma, which you know what's that going to be in there. You know, that's clothes or pajamas, one of the two. And so he opens up, something, he screams wildly, and then goes, oh, clothes. And he just ditches us aside. And uh, so, so for, sometimes for kids, it can be that way. Um, I heard about this little girl that was uh, about eight years old, I guess, and uh, she had not gotten what she wanted for Christmas, so there was angst for her for sure. Uh, Also, she had gotten in a fight with her brother during Christmas break from school, and also she had mistreated the family cat which ended her up in her own room one night late, or one night to go to bed early. And so uh, there she was, and she was praying her bedtime prayer. It was the model prayer, sometimes maybe wrongly called the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And then it came out this way. And forgive our Christmases as we forgive those who Christmas against us. Well, sometimes that's how it feels. Kids can have some angst, but adults can too. Because in the midst of celebrating this marvelous incarnation of Jesus Christ, all I would have to say is, Ukraine, or Gaza. And all of us would feel our gut kind of tighten just a little bit. I was over in Kherson, Ukraine, in 2012, and saw our Bible college there, Tavrisky Christian Institute. It's right on the Dnieper River where the communists used to float the boats down to the Black Sea from Kiev. And uh, they took over a a commander's uh, set of barracks and turned it into a Bible college, really beautified the grounds. And when the Russians invaded from the south in Kherson, a city of over 100,000 people, they literally, when they left that Bible college campus, it was just trashed. I've seen pictures of it. If you were at ICOM in Oklahoma City, maybe some of you were at the missionary conference there, uh, my friend Valentin Sini, the president of uh, Tavrisky Christian Institute, was there. They showed pictures. And it just, it, it was at Christmas time, almost, you know, November, ICOM, Oklahoma City, and it, your, your stomach just ties in knots. So that, it's just, it's like, oh man, that's not how this should be. And I don't have to even say much more about the Gaza Strip uh, challenges that are there. This is such a layered problem, a layered problem uh, all the way through. And I'd have to tell you just existentially or personally, Christmas always has a little bit of that for us. Because on December 24th, 1984, my father-in-law, who was 74 years old and had had emphysema for some years on Christmas Eve morning at about 5.20, went home to his forever home. David Faust recently wrote in the Christian Standard, we should quit saying, oh, he passed away. We should say, he lives forever. But anyway, uh, you know, that's been 39 years ago today. Uh, whenever we're in Israel and we get to, you know, part of the plate where, where the praetorium and maybe where Jesus could have been bludgeoned, although there's debate about was it there, was it over at, you know, Herod's palace, where was this that it happened? Anyway, uh, they will have uh, Miss Carla, my wife, lead us all in the old rugged cross. She can't get through that. It was her dad's favorite song. And it's difficult. 
and you think back to 39 years. It seems like yesterday, and yet it seems so long ago as well. And uh, for 39 years, my wife has awakened on Christmas Eve morning at 520 exactly without trying. It's like it's almost mystical. So there is this, this paradox. There is a, that celebrating God becoming man has, well, listen, that's how the first Christmas was. So just, I put on your sheet there a few of those kind of things, that that's how that was. Uh, political oppression, uh, displacements, refugees. Wow. What does Christmas say about immigration? Uh, taxation, interpersonal conflict, the irony or the paradox of Christmas. For those earliest believers in the early centuries of the church, all you would have had to say was Egypt or Herod. And that was enough. Just those labels, that name and that place would be that. So with that little bit of background, I want you to turn to Hosea here. And uh, there are people that, of course, understood this more parabolically, symbolically. I think there is some symbolism. We will come to that. But I want you to come to Hosea 11. I think this is one of the great love chapters of the Bible. I really do. I think it rates right up there with uh, 1 Corinthians 13, with John 3, 1 John 4, John 13, other passages. But this is a great love chapter. And you will see, I think, first of all, I think the main heading there is that love is the motivation for Christmas. In the midst of the struggles, in the midst of the paradox, in the midst of the angst, there is this love that comes through there, and you see it in the very first verse. So Hosea 11.1, 1, in the Minor Prophets, is quoted in Matthew 2.15, and here is the statement. When Israel was a child, I take that to be literal Israel, physical Israel, the nation of Israel. Child is the Hebrew word na'ar, and it means lad or youth or boy. When Israel was a child, I loved him. Hebrew word ahav is this word that's used kind of generic, love of family, love of things, love of God, love from God. It, it would be the word that we would know similar to in the New Testament, agape, just it's, or phileo, it's used of love. I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my bane, my son. Uh, in uh, Exodus 14, when the Israelites are coming out of Egypt, God actually calls the nation of Israel his firstborn. So it's pretty clear. I mean, who would be reading this passage and say, this has got to refer to God's son as the nation of Israel? I don't know how else you'd read this if you just read it from here. When you get to Matthew, all of a sudden we have some other things going on. But let's just think for a minute about this passage. This passage declares the love of God. Out of Egypt, I called my son. He is the one that I loved. So that's why I put on your sheet here, love is the motivation for Christmas. And what you have is this word ahav gets fleshed out in the rest of this love chapter. If you still got your Bibles open, just skip down a few verses to verse 3. Uh, he says, out of Egypt, if I call my son, I've loved you, but you didn't love me back. You turned away from me. And then he says, yet, verse 3, I'm reading ESV, by the way, it was I who taught Ephraim, and you would know that to be another name for Israel at times, Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms. You got the picture? It's that of a little child holding on to dad's fingers as dad makes the kid kind of wobble and get his first steps. We just became great grandparents. Our oldest grandchild got married and married a kid. They're headed to South Korea to be missionaries. But anyway, they had little Wesley. And that's because their favorite movie is Princess Bride. So pray about that. Anyway, Wesley. So Wesley is now just about nine, ten months, and he's learning how to walk, doing pretty good with it, really. It was I, God says, that taught Israel how to walk, but they didn't know I healed them. Have you ever noticed providentially that God is always working upstream from us? It would be amazing what we, uh, if we ever knew what didn't happen to us, correct? Some of you have heard the good preaching minister who's the president of Ozark Christian College, Matt Proctor. He's a great preacher. Part of what makes him such a great preacher is every Sunday he's in town, he does junior church. He preaches to little kids, which might be why he's so good. But anyway, uh, Matt was taking some kids on the night of May 22nd, 2011, uh, en route back from the church to their homes in the church van of the little church where he attends in Joplin, Missouri. If you might remember, there was a certain storm coming through town at the time at about a mile wide at the base, an EF-5 tornado. 
and a tree slammed down right in front of that van. He had to stop. He got the kids out of the van. They ran to a nearby house. And you might think, bummer, you know, the tree kept me from getting those kids to their homes appropriately. Actually, the tree saved their lives. Had they been going on, they would have been right in the path of the... How many things happen to us that we never know or don't happen to us that God was in His providence protect us? They didn't know. I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws, and I bent down to them and fed them. You get the imagery of the farm. This is somebody who's adjusting that yoke on the neck of the oxen so that it can pull the plow well, but now I'll ease the yoke off so that the oxen can eat. Beautiful passage. God's loving providential care. Now skip down, if you will, to verse 8. Verse 8. God wrestles with himself. This is God talking to himself. You get an inside uh, hearing. We get to overhear the Trinity talking. How can I give you up, O Ephraim? He's ready to. He, they deserve it. They should be judged. And again, Ephraim, a name for Israel. How can I hand you over, O Israel? Notice the parallelism. That's big with the prophets and the poets. How can I make you like Adma? And how can I treat you like Zeboim? Now, those are two cities, if you don't know, near Sodom and Gomorrah. And they would have been taken out at the time when Sodom and Gomorrah, Genesis 19, that's a text for Caleb, not for me, uh, would, have, would, have, would have been part of that. My heart recoils within me, says God. My compassion grows warm and tender. I think Eugene Peterson in the message paraphrase translates it, my heart does flip-flops. I wonder how much of this internal debate God has about us. I don't know. I will not execute my burning anger. I will not destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your midst. I will not come in wrath. This is God talking about his own character. And that's why I say here is Hosea 11.1, 1, a Christmas text, going to connect it with Jesus as his son coming out of Egypt due to Herod's uh, evil schemes. But all through it, you're seeing love being the motivation. Charles Haddon Spurgeon says that that passage, I will not come in wrath, is the weather vane of Christianity. It points us in the direction of the love of God. Now, that being the case, I just want to have us pause for a minute and say, wait a minute, where in the minor prophets are we? Oh, yeah, Hosea. Hosea. The story of a broken home. The story of where your kids are named things that it's like, oh man, really? We named our first kid Casey Jonathan because Jonathan means gift of God. We named our second child Corey Andrew because Andrew was always bringing people to Jesus. We named our third child Anne Elizabeth because my wife said we were going to, that's why. But anyway, it's just, why do you name your kids what you name them? Well, Gomer and Hosea had names for their kids. Hey, not my people, come to dinner. Hey, no more mercy. Come on. You know the story. And I don't have anybody that's been able to get their arms around this as emotionally for me as the African-American preacher E.K. Bailey. He's died. He's gone on to be with the Lord. Preached in Texas, preached in California. He has a, favor, a famous sermon called, My Name is Hosea. There's another title to it, but I can't say that name in church. Uh, there, My Name is Hosea by E.K. Bailey. If you can ever get online and listen to that sermon, it's a first-person sermon. What he basically did was took Donald Sanukian's sermon on uh, A Night in Persia, which is a book sermon on Esther from the perspective of a eunuch named Harbona, which is mentioned in the Bible, by the way. He did a similar kind of thing by making it first person. And I tell you, folks, <laughs> when you get down to where Hosea goes to try to reclaim Gomer, I can hardly take it. Because uh, here Gomer has gone back to her cult prostitution and uh, th that Hosea hears, this is the storyline of the, Hosea hears that she's up for auction. And so he goes with his prophetic mantle to the marketplace and there on a podium, sometimes we talk about podiums, we mix up podiums and lecterns. This is a lectern. This I'm standing on is a podium. So he sees her on the podium and, uh, you know, he, he, she's naked so that the buyers can see what they're going to get. And uh, Hosea comes up on stage, E.K. Bailey says, and he says, I will outbid anyone here. It doesn't matter what the bid is, I will outbid them. 
And so the gavel hits the bench. She is sold. And Hosea goes over to Gomer and takes off his prophetic mantle and he starts to put it around her. And she says, oh, Hosea, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean. And he closes her and says, shh, be quiet. I need my wife. Our children need their mother. We're going to go home now. That's the paradox of Christmas. Somebody has to pay a price. That's why love is the motivation. It's upside down. Amidst all the Roman oppression and everything else, that's what you get. So at our little church, we, like I told you, this is the craziest place I'm at. You know, we sing traditional music and uh, the average age demographic, as I mentioned, is just a bunch of old people hanging out together. And it's just crazy. And we've, 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 we've had some <laughs> growth and all. But anyway, we, my wife had this idea, since our name is Park Plaza Christian Church, to have, a, uh, to have a thing called Christmas at the Plaza. Sounds like something in Kansas City, you know. Uh, Caleb. But anyway, Christmas at the Plaza. So the first year we did this, our people weren't sure, but what was exciting to me was about 150 of our people were involved in this two-day production. Well, we had so many requests, we had to go to a three-day production, which for our old people just about maxes them out. Anyway, so this last year we did that. So the first year we had a special guest artist from Indianapolis. The next year we kind of did it on our own, just local talent and stuff. It's just a traditional Christmas classic concert because that's rarely done these days anymore. So for an hour and a half we did this. And so the last year we had different strings and it was a lot of fun. This year the accent was on the shepherds. So a lot of the music had to do with the shepherds. Next year, my wife tells me they're planning to do the aspect of the angels. There's a lot about the angels in the, in the Christmas story. It's from the perspective of the angels. And all right, she's been working on the script and thinking about it. And it, it really gets at this love as the motivation for this in the midst of all the oppression. Because as, I think sometimes we think the angels are omniscient. They're not. In fact, you ready for this? First Peter 1, they actually look at the church to figure out the plan of God. How well are we doing educating the angels, folks? So anyway, the angels are thinking about the incarnation of Jesus and he's coming to earth. And somebody finally says, you know, he won't come back the way he went. Paul writing 1 Timothy years later after this event says there is one mediator between God and man. Ready for the next line? The man, Christ Jesus. And I think when I was in my grad studies at Lincoln, it was Cyril Simpkins that pointed out, why does he call him a man? He's back in heaven. He's at the right hand of God. He intercedes for the saints. He's the divine son, the monogonase, the only begotten. But Paul calls him, years later, the man. See, he would never go back the same way he left. That, my friends, is the love of God. Love is the motivation for this. Out of Egypt, this is my son. I loved him. Now, let's keep going. Here's another aspect of it. Redemption is the power behind Christmas. Redemption is the power behind Christmas. Where did the text say he would come from? Out of Egypt. Certain names just make us think of certain things, right? If I say Plymouth Rock, have some of you been there and seen the stone, 1620, when the pilgrims landed there in Massachusetts? Yeah, we, all you have to say is Plymouth Rock. You don't have to say pilgrims, just Plymouth Rock. Now, just in kudos to our other speaker, you know, Mr. Caleb, just say Arrowhead Stadium. What do you think of? Well, of course, you think of this team that, good luck. Uh, you know, I don't know if that's going to happen. But anyway, could, could. A lot of people down where I live as a Bronco fan, they think it's going to happen. When I take out my Bronco debit card, I get in a lot of trouble in Joplin. But anyway, um, it, maybe they would think of Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes having to play, pay a fine for barking at the refs. I don't know. But anyway, you just say Arrowhead Stadium. People think of the Chiefs. If I said Alcatraz, you think of prison. What do you think comes in the reservoir of people's brains in the ancient world when you say, Egypt? Well, it was a place of refuge. Jeremiah and others did escape there. But for the most part, it will remind you, no, that's where people come that have been redeemed. Here's the thing you have to think about there, is if the text says, out of Egypt have I called my son, what had to happen for that to take place? The death of the firstborn of the nation of Egypt. And not only that, but the Passover lamb. Now we get our lambs mixed up in the Bible, okay? There were lambs and there were lambs and there were lambs, says Fred Craddock. 
And actually, the Passover lamb was not a lamb of sacrifice. The Passover lamb was a lamb eaten on your feet. Get ready. Bitter herbs. Get up. We're going we're gonna to leave Egypt out on our own. So it occurs to me that for redemption to take place, what you have is you've got death all over the place. And when you read in the New Testament, you have to kind of combine Matthew with Luke at this point. When you read in the New Testament about this idea of redemption, you, you might remember that good old Simeon, when Simeon comes forth to sing his song about this Messiah, the last verse of that song is, and a sword will pierce your own soul, Mary. Mm. See, what I'm saying is there's death all around this great incarnation event. So we have a grandson named Asa, King Asa, and he just turned six and we had his birthday. He wanted a Star Wars birthday. His dad, who teaches at Ozark Christian College, has uh, gotten him into Star Wars, I guess. Although I shouldn't say that. It's not accurate to say we had a Star Wars themed birthday. It was a Darth Vader so pray about this kid. He's obviously demon-possessed. But anyway, just, wow, what's, why do you want a Darth Vader birthday, son? Anyway, he just is into the He'll go around the house going, dun, 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 dun. You know, that's just what he does. And I, I got to thinking about this and try to connect with the little guy. He's a fun little kid. But anyway, everybody dies in Star Wars. Obi-Wan Kenobi died. Luke Skywalker dies. Even Han Solo dies. Everybody dies for the victory to be achieved. You with me? No redemption, no victory unless somebody dies. Out of Egypt have I called my son. Another nuance of this is, what's your Egypt? Egypt stands for bondage, slavery. Jesus said in John 8, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. So what's your Egypt? Is it a habit? Is it an addiction? Is it, uh, you know, wh what is it for you? That would have to be unpacked. What needs redeemed? Lastly, thinking about this fulfillment, especially relates to the Matthew 2 fulfillment part, is liberation is the result of Christmas. R liberation is the result of this Christmas. What did, the, where'd they go after Egypt? Well, they went out into the wilderness. <laughs> they were free, but they were in the wilderness. The Passover meal and the Passover lamb meant liberation but it doesn't mean easy street. It really doesn't. Um, let me tell you a little bit of a story here from my Illinois days when we were up the road at Springfield area, Rochester. Uh, one night on our 10th wedding anniversary, we got a, the phone rang about 10 o'clock and uh, a young man said, what are you doing? And I thought that was none of his business. But anyway, uh, I said, uh, well, just sitting here watching the news. And uh, he said, we're coming over. I didn't remember inviting them. But anyway, here these two high school junior boys came over to the house at 10 o'clock at night on the night of our 10th wedding anniversary. And so he, this was, you know, this guy was witnessing to the, his friend. Brian was witnessing to Eddie. And Eddie wanted to become a Christian, but he didn't know how to. Now, Brian hadn't even accepted Christ as his Savior yet anyway. But he'd been coming, bringing... So anyway, here's Eddie. We meet Eddie. Eddie's family had means, but Eddie... Uh, it was going to be a tough go. His two sisters, I think when they turned 14, mom and dad threw a beer party for them in their, for, their, for their birthdays. Uh, the other brother was in jail on a drug charge. All kinds of difficulty in the family itself. Uh, but uh, Eddie seemed like he wanted to be a Christian, so we were trying to explain to him how to become a Christian, how to respond to God in faith for his grace, and kind of trying to lay this out. Uh, at which point, uh, he just I didn't think he was really getting it. I thought, he, just, I, he said, okay, okay, he just, too agreeable. And I said, finally, I went for the juggler vein. I said, Eddie, after Jesus was baptized, the first place he went was into the desert. Thought that'd get him. You know, he said, okay. Oh, man, sheesh. Anyway, that was a Thursday night. Friday, Sunday, Sunday came, here he came, his church, steps forward, never been in church before. And he steps forward, confesses Christ, we baptize him. As he's leaving the auditorium, still dripping wet from the baptistry. I said, Eddie, we're proud of you for taking your stand for Jesus today. You know what that high school junior said to me? Well, now to the desert. He understood more what it meant to follow Jesus than a lot of adults I've baptized. It's not a walk. Liberation does not mean a walk in the park. It's not easy street. The wilderness, God would test these people to see if they would obey him and believe him. 
The wilderness was a test. It was a place of refuge in some ways, but it was also a place of testing. Think of it this way. In 1776, when a bunch of guys got together in Philadelphia and signed a piece of paper, and one guy signed his name rather large, you remember, that just made it all proper to say, King of England, we're not going to have taxation without representation. No way. We're out of here. No, it wasn't over, was it? That was just the beginning of the war. So after you've had your liberation doesn't mean it's over. Now at that point, I'd like to relate this other passage. Let me weave this in if I can at this point. Because there are two great minor prophets, uh, well, I shouldn't say that minor, I should say major prophet alongside of the minor prophet in Matthew chapter 2. So in chapter 2, you know how the visit of the Magi, the visit of the wise men, and they retrace Abraham's steps, as I said earlier. And anyway, they learned of the story, so they go back another way. The angels have helped them. They don't go back to Jerusalem to tell Herod. Herod finds out. He's furious. In fact, the Greek word means his thermometer blew up. And so anyway, he sends down, he's going to kill all the babies two years down. Joseph and Mary probably take the child. By the way, every time Jesus is called, referred to in Matthew 2, he's called the child. So he's, he's playing with Tupperware at this point, you know. He's a two-year-old. He's a toddler. He's into everything. So anyway, they take Jesus and probably use the gold, frankincense, and myrrh to finance their trip to Egypt. And while they're there, Herod sends his butchers, and in Ramah and Jerusalem and Bethlehem, they kill. Now, given the population, probably we're talking about 20 to 25 babies. But this is my judgment. One baby is too many to lose. And so, anyway, by the time Herod dies, which is 4 B.C., the calendar's goofy, don't worry about it. Anyway, at 4, about 4 B.C., then Jesus comes out of there because Joseph, who's a dreamer, because the Old Testament Joseph was a dreamer, uh, too, they come out of Egypt, and they come back, and they find out, oh, here's the thing. And that's where we read this other passage. And what I'm trying to illustrate is that it's not easy street. You, liberation, Christmas can mean liberation, but it's not easy street. So... There's an interesting layered prophecy here, but not from the minor prophets, but from the major. Jeremiah 31, 15, a voice was heard in Ramah, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they were not. And that's quoted in Matthew 2, 18, just a few verses from out of Egypt have I called my son. Now, what's the significance of that? What's going on? Well, like I said, it's layered. You got Genesis 35, you got Jeremiah 31, you got Matthew chapter 2. What's going on here? Rachel symbolically stands for the, for the uh, you know, mothers of Israel. At first she was weeping when she died and gave birth to Benjamin in the process. Now it's centuries later, at the time of Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, trying to get the people in 586 ready to go to Babylonian captivity. And it's as if the mothers of Israel have come forth from their grave and they're once again crying as they see their sons hauled off to Babylonian captivity. Now it's centuries later, and once again the mothers of Israel are weeping, and the prophecy is basically, just let me cry. Don't try, this is for the men in the crowd, don't fix anything. Just let me bawl. Sometimes we're redeemed by our tears. And so that's where we are. Well, you remember that Rachel died near Bethlehem? So this is all part of that story, the mothers of Israel weeping once again. Now here's the thing. You remember me telling you this morning that when we're studying these minor prophets and from major prophets, you have to expand the context. So I just want to say for a minute, Jeremiah 31. Didn't exactly flip your switch, did it? Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah 31, Jeremiah 31. What's in Jeremiah 31? Well, in verse 15, a voice was heard in Ramah, Rachel weeping for her children. But if you keep reading, you'll read something like this in the same chapter. A new covenant I will establish with the house of Israel, not like the old one that was written on tablets of stone, but that which was written on the heart. And you won't have to say, know the Lord, for everyone shall know me. That's the prophecy of the new covenant, which is quoted at length in Hebrews chapter 8. Now here's the point. Yes, mothers of Israel, I'm so sorry your innocent baby should not have had to die because of this butcher. That's unfortunate. But because of that event, one little baby escaped. And that baby will come someday. And he will make a whole new way by which people are made right with God. The new covenant. So, yeah, love is the motivation behind Christmas. <laughs> 
and uh, redemption is the power behind it, and liberation is the result of it for sure. So I put it this way, uh, the paradox of Christmas is suffering. I sure wish I had a different sermon to preach than that. The paradox of Christmas is suffering. Why is that? Some of you know Tommy Oaks. Raise your hand if you haven't known that name before. Yeah, he's one of my favorite preachers. And when I was serving as academic dean, we'd have him come and do his preaching and storytelling seminar. He's just a great storyteller and a great preacher. But I remember Tommy used to have a sermon called, Quit Looking for an Easy Life. Any of you hear that one before? Except that's not how he said it. He said it this way, Quit Looking for an Easy Life. That's how I said it. Anyway, you're looking for an easy life. You're, and it's just a refrain sermon. It's like, your problem is you're looking for an easy life. If you quit looking for an easy life, then you wouldn't have so much problem. See, you're disappointed because you're looking for an easy life. He just went this over and over. He just kept banging away at that. And maybe that's what Christmas tells us. Quit looking for an easy life. Quit doing that. Uh, I told you we sing. <laughs> we, don't say, we don't use the hymnal. We sing with TV screens, but we still sing old songs. And so the Sunday we were going to be working on this prophecy from Hosea, you know, uh, out of Egypt have I called my son. Our music minister said, what song? He always asked me this, what song do you want to use for an invitation? Yes, we still have an invitation at our church. We're so old-fashioned. And uh, so anyway, uh, any, we, we, I said, oh, I, I, usually I just say, oh, Marshall, you just choose. I, I don't know. You, whatever you choose will be fine. He reads my manuscript, so he knows where I'm going. But um, it just so happened that that year I said, well, let's use just as I am. We haven't used that for a long time. And uh, so I thought that would fit, you know, just come to Christ where we are, blah, blah, blah. But uh, anyway, uh, he about five minutes later wrote back and said, how about this one? And he changed it. I thought, who's the senior minister here? Anyway, but he was, he was right. And it was that old song, out of my bondage, sorrow and pride, Jesus I come, Jesus I come. Do you remember that old song? All four stanzas we, we sang that particular morning because of it. That song was, the lyrics for that song was written by this fellow named George True Sleeper. Is that a name for a preacher or what? George True Sleeper. You talk about putting them out. That's it. But along with this George Cole Stebbins, who was the guy that did the music line of it, uh, if the musical score of it, they put out of my bondage. And I just put down here some of the stanzas. Stanza one, out of my bondage into freedom. Stanza two, out of my loss into the gain of the cross. Stanza three, out of my pride and into thy will. Stanza four, out of the pride and into the joy of home. The, the paradox of Christmas is suffering. I wish I had a different Christmas message. But as we came to Christmas this past Christmas, that's where the world was, wasn't it? And some of the cultural issues we're facing give us such heartbreak and difficulty. And yet what opportunity lies before us as well? Well, I don't know if I'm a little ahead of schedule, but I think that's, I don't want to go into Jonah right now. So Jeff, I'll let you tell us of the time constraints here of what we should do. But there's two minor prophet things, if you will. And uh, so uh, out of Egypt have I called my son and the one we covered this morning or earlier today. Okay, let me draw a string under it there. Give us our time constraints, Jeff.